Greetings, friends. It is good to welcome you to this time of worship today. It is July 19th, 2020, and we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us here at First United Methodist Church of Northville. This is indeed a beautiful summer day, and we thank God for the many blessings of creation, birds that sing and flowers that bloom and smell, uh, dewy grass between our toes. What a fun feeling that is. This is indeed the day our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As has become our custom, I invite you to find your candle if you haven't already done so, and to take a moment to light it. And as we do, may it remind us of the presence of God's Holy Spirit and of our connection to one another as we worship this day. I would invite you now to rise in spirit as we sing together our opening hymn. This is my Father's word, and to my listening all nature sings and round me rings the music of the sphere. So were you singing? Did you sing along with that song that celebrates God's creation this day? I hope so. Sometimes we wonder if anybody really is singing along with us because it can feel awkward to be uh, singing in your own home like that, or perhaps even a little more odd when there are others in the room with you. And yet at home is one of the safest places we have right now to be able to sing. And so I hope you were indeed able to join in that great hymn of praise. As you register your attendance using one of the tabs immediately below the screen, you might just jot us a note that says, yes, I was singing as you fill that out and send it our way. I would also invite you to use the tab that is there for prayer requests. If there's anything that we can be praying with you or for you about, please let us know um, by filling out that prayer request so that we can uh, be in touch with you and be praying with you and for you in these coming days. And as always, there's a place there for you to offer your gifts to God. We're so grateful to all of you who've been able to continue your giving so that we might continue the ministries that are ours to do, even while we're not able to worship together. So please take a moment. There are multiple ways you can give electronically, as well as simply um, putting a check in the mail to the church your generosity allows us to be in ministry outside the walls of the church, to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. So thank you for your ongoing gifts to make this happen. I would invite you now to take a deep breath. And as you do, may it help to ready your mind and spirit as we use this centering song to prepare for prayer.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, you who created the order of all that is and called it good, you who knows of all that grows in the gardens of our lives and loves us still, we enter into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the outpouring of love and mercy and forgiveness and strength and joy that you seek to pour into us always through every day, but particularly in these acts of worship as we set our eyes and our focus upon you, Lord. And as we think about all those in our lives who carry our hearts and our concerns, those for whom we pray, we lift them up to you right now, Lord, asking for your healing, mercy, and presence with all those we love, with all those who need your care and comfort. We know you are always actively providing all that is needed, and yet you ask us to come to you with our heart's concerns, and we do. Be with us this day. Care for our aches and pains, our discomforts, the things that worry and burden us. And Lord, help us to have the strength and the willpower to leave all those things in your good and loving hands as we seek to focus on you, to turn our eyes upon you, and as we move forward into this time of worship, Lord, we think about those things that grow in the gardens of our lives, those things that are good for us and those things which cause us harm, those things which have been planted there by you and things that have come through other means. We ask you to be so aware of all that is happening within us and around us and to commit all that we do in our lives into your care and your love. And as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. I will be reading from the message version. He told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while his hired men were asleep, his enemy sowed thistles all through the wheat and slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistles showed up too. 
the farm hands came to the farmer and said, Master, that was clean seed you planted, wasn't it? Where did these thistles come from? He answered, Some enemy did this. The farm hands asked, Should we weed out the thistles? He said, No, if you weed the thistles, you'll pull up the wheat too. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles and tie them in bundles for the fire. Then gather the wheat and put it in the barn. Jesus dismissed the congregation and went into the house. His disciples came in and said, explain to us that story of the thistles in the field. So he explained, the farmer who sows the pure seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the pure seeds are subjects of the kingdom, the thistles are subjects of the devil, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the curtain of history. The harvest hands are angels. The picture of thistles pulled up and burned is a scene from the final act. The son of man will send his angels, weed out the thistles from his kingdom, pitch them in the trash and be done with them. They are going to complain to high heaven, but nobody is going to listen. At the same time, ripe holy lives will mature and adorn the kingdom of their father. Are you listening to this? Really listening. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. So here we are once more on the path. Our beautiful garden created by and for our congregation and the community, offering a reflective journey and spiritual connection through nature. Reverend Alice Ford chose this place to preach her first sermon among us just last week. Fitting as it is for considering the parable of the seed and the sower. Now I'm here too because Jesus followed up on that story with yet another one dealing with the good earth, namely the parable I call the wheat and the weeds. But just before we wade into that messy field, I want to establish my credentials to do so and with pleasure. I'm not talking about my seminary education, though it was excellent and I'm very grateful for it. I'm not talking about my half century of teaching and preaching on the often confusing and mysterious parables of Jesus. No, I'm referring to my heritage as the son of parents who were raised on a farm. Like all of their siblings, they too eventually left those farms for greener pastures in cities and suburbs where I was raised after the age of seven. But those first years living in rural Shiawassee County, between the city of Flint where I was born and the town of Owasso where my father worked, living between two uncles who farmed the land on either side of the home my parents built, living between pasture and woodlot, between cornfields and wheat fields, don't you just imagine as a rambunctious kid playing outside with an older brother and lots of cousins, I got enough dirt un under my fingernails to last a lifetime. That nature connection has been nurtured across the years with gardens everywhere I've lived, across the breadth and depth and length of Michigan, from Niles to Detroit to Mackinac. There have always been flowers in those gardens, annuals and perennials, and always at least a few tomato plants, if only in containers. In a few of those places, there was enough room for more. Cucumbers and beans, carrots, onions, and a couple of times, even small plots of corn. Though the raccoons always enjoyed more of that than I ever did. But it has always been fun trying to plant and tend, to water and feed, 
and always, always to weed and weed and weed some more. That seems to be the curse of every tiller of the soil since we were cast out of Eden, a garden utterly devoid of weeds. Ah, paradise lost, a weed-free zone. That would indeed, at least for us gardeners, be like the kingdom of God, heaven on earth. Like every hopeful planter in the spring, with glorious visions of success in their minds, akin to the promising pictures of abundance pictured in the seed catalogs, incidentally that always make you forget last year's failures, this ancient farmer sowed good seed in his field. Just imagine it, the good earth broken open and ready to receive it. The sunshine and the rains ready to do their part as ever. All should be bright and beautiful, right? I had enough farmers in two of my churches to quickly confirm what my parents and aunts and uncles all had decided. There must be an easier way to make a living. Though these were all successful farmers, I quickly learned that they were the biggest gamblers that I had ever known. Despite their best practices and long experience, they were at the risk of weather and pests and blight and weeds every year. But they kept planting through lean and plenty. God bless them. So too the farmer in Jesus' story made a good start, planted in hopes of an abundant harvest. But then an enemy snuck into the field under cover of darkness and sowed weeds all over it. Invisible at first to the naked eye, it became apparent only when both wheat and weeds sprouted together. When the realization of it hit him, he concludes, an enemy has done this. His workers see it and ask him, do you want us to go and gather them, pull them out one by one, make the field weed free? That must have been a tempting offer but he was wise enough to know that to pull the bad was to risk the good, their roots already intertwined. No, he responds, we'll just have to wait until harvest. And then the reapers can pull the weeds and bind them in bundles to be burned. Only then can the wheat be safely harvested and stored in my barn. Of course, we see the wisdom in that, taking the long view and making the best of a bad situation. In and out of gardens, I've been forced to do that any number of times. And most of the folks I know anything about have had to make the same hard choices. Life is rarely so simple and clear that we can just uproot our problems and with a good riddance, toss them aside or more satisfying into a bonfire. Hmm, maybe that's why we find sitting around a fire on a summer evening so mesmerizing. As if to say, if only I could throw this issue or this doubt or this regret or this fear or this vexing relationship into that fire and watch it be consumed once and for all. <laughs> Don't let the smoke get in your eyes. Maybe the reason I've always weeded my gardens so thoroughly is because I could. I could control at least this little corner of creation 
hoping for the best outcomes. You know, juicy tomatoes, crunchy cucumbers. Whereas any number of challenging and difficult problems needed to be hands off. As doing something, anything, might well make them worse. Let's wait and see, others counseled me. And sometimes they were right, but not always. There are times when you just have to wade right in, even where the proverbial angels fear to tread. Because the weeds are going to overcome the wheat, they're going to choke it, they're going to suck up all the moisture and nutrients and leave nothing for the rightful crop to thrive on. Sometimes it works and other times not so much. But there was never a time I regretted at least giving it a try. And other times I wish I hadn't waited so long. And other times when I regretted even failing to act. So when the disciples ask Jesus to explain this story, it goes pretty much as you would expect. The sower of the good seed is, of course, the Son of Man, Christ our Lord and Savior. The field is the world, of course. The good seed? Well, that's the children of the kingdom, what Reverend Alice last week called germinated Christians, growing disciples. All that's good news. But then the bad news. The weeds are sown by the devil. And those seeds are the children of evil. Groan, boo, hiss. But the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Finally, good and evil will be separated. And evil shall be utterly destroyed. That's the happy ending we're all looking for, right? Unless you're a weed seed, of course. At another time and place, Jesus taught, judge not lest you be judged. That's a hard one, too. I'm 99% sure I know a weed when I see one. And my first urge is to yank it out. I have very little patience for waiting until God gets around to it at the end of time. Not that that promise doesn't give me hope for the ultimate victory of good over evil. It absolutely does. But right now, everywhere I look, our garden is a mess. The weeds are taking over, suffocating the very life out of us. I hardly need to enumerate the species and the varieties of harmful weeds thriving in our midst. You can make your own list. But rather than working together to save the crop, we seem to prefer standing on the edge of the field arguing, that's not a weed, let it be, it won't hurt anything. Stop complaining, stop protesting. It's just a few weeds. This is the greatest crop of wheat we've ever seen. Don't mess with it. So, hoes and pitchforks in hand, we stand face to face, angrily denouncing one another. What good in that? You're a real, you're not a real farmer. You're just a troublemaker. In fact, I'll bet you're the evil one who sowed the weed seeds. You're the enemy. Three years before the outbreak of the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Is it too much of a stretching paraphrase to suggest 
a field fought over and thus untended will yield little of value. Oh, friends, that we might realize in time that it is not my field, it is not your field, it is our field. Languishing now for want of our mutual care and concern. We are in danger of losing the crop. Well, one could argue that this parable in the end supports passivity in the face of evil. You know, just let God sort it all out at the end. That hardly jibes with our baptismal vows. Remember? Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of the world? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Maybe you don't remember answering those questions with a resounding, I do. But if you do, it might be time to confidently courageously, carefully cultivate your field, my field, our field, garden, containers, and pots. Because, have you noticed? Those pesky weeds just keep popping up. Dig it? Sure you do. Amen. This is my Father's work. Oh, let me never forget That though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the Finally, friends, this matter of wheat and weeds is not only about we, it's about me. A recently retired United Methodist pastor, the Reverend Steve Garnis Holmes, writes a daily blog, devotional poetry, really, on scripture. Here's what he has to say about the wheat and the weeds. God, I meant to be a good person. I wanted to pr produce wisdom and justice. How is it I am so compromised? There is goodness and mercy in me, and there is selfishness and fear, privilege that serves only my fake desires. I've been asleep. I missed it when my ego crept in and sowed all this junk in me. I want to march through the field of my life and tear out all the weeds. I want to be better now. But look how harsh I am judging myself. My hands are full not of the fruit of love, but shame and a scythe. Some of me that I am disappointed in hides your blessing, wheat among the weeds. Only you know the true fruits I bear. 
I set aside my weapons. I let go of accusing myself. I accept myself as I am, wheat and weeds. I trust you to glean the grain from my field and remove the rest, gone, cleansed, burned forever. May my peace and acceptance be the seeds I sow for the next harvest. All for the glory of God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Amen. Do all the good you can By all the means you can